So she could put her wall yeah. water thing in. I got it. Okay. So when she takes her wall water out, we make sure she's all right. Yeah, that's why I was going to put a gap over that so nobody unplugs it again. That's what I want. We will start in a couple of minutes, just like two more maybe.
let's start, everyone. Um, so welcome to Women in Computer Vision Workshop. Uh, this year we are organizing fourth of it, and we are really happy to see all of you here and all of you in the. You, you are welcome to join. <laughs> all of you here and all of you on live stream uh, uh, watching us. Um, thank you for coming. So why do we? Why do we even need a woman in computer workshop, right? Like, um, why there is no men in computer vision, or like, why the other motivation? So, um, computer vision is awesome. It's like getting more popular, etc. But where are we? Like, when you look at the session in CVPR, in the main session in CVPR, or when you look at um, on in the hall, like while walking, or when you look at your lab, like, where is the woman, right? Um, there is low percentage of female faculty and researchers, and it's not changing if it's academia or industry. Like, um, we want to see more of us. Like, we want to have the equal representation of uh, everyone. Um, and those, like, low percentages uh, create those the isolation, like lack of inclusion, unbalanced workplaces, and these are all like negative effects on our productivity, on everyone's productivity. We need more ideas, we need more perspectives to have to create things that that um, to, to create research or create product or create engineering resources for, for that 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 um, uh, that um, addresses everyone. So. Uh, the goals of our workshop is raise visible. So for that, we had like three main goals, and those goals we are trying to achieve by the things that I will be uh, listing here. So the first goal is raising uh, visibility of women in computer vision. To achieve that, we are inviting high quality research talks by junior and sen senior researchers. We give opportunity to present research talks in a for professional and supportive settings to those, especially junior uh, researchers and PhD students, uh, because they don't have actually have that opportunity uh, uh, either financially or they don't have that support environment, so we try to pro um, produce that environment. And we also <clears throat> do that by discussing the inclusion and diversity topics in an open and friendly environment between both female and male colleagues. And uh, this will address, to, like I will uh, explain, uh, the panel that we will do, like the stories and experiences panel that we will have at 4.30 uh, with male and female colleagues from uh, academia. Um, the second goal is giving opportunities to junior and female students and researchers. So we do that by enabling them to present their work via poster session in CVPR. And CVPR is that really like well-respected uh, venue that everyone wants to uh, present. And this is how we are increasing, uh, giving opportunities to uh, junior researchers. Uh, the other thing is like uh, getting rid of the economical barriers, you know, like there are many women researchers, there are many researchers, yes, but there are like many women researchers that doesn't have the funding to come here. Their lab doesn't uh, give the funding, their professors doesn't have the funding, etc. So uh, we are trying to encourage them by providing travel awards. Uh, and lastly, we want to maintain and grow the uh, WIGBI network, Women in Computer Vision network, by organizing a mentoring banquet, which was last night, and thank you all for coming and attending there. Um, so organizing a mentoring banquet to provide a safe and casual environment for those uh, relationships to be seeded. And we are doing it before the workshop so that like all that uh, environment and all that support uh, people that you actually get get to know in the banquet. Uh, now you can spend the day with them. Like in the breaks, you can like discuss posters with them or discuss your career choices, mentorship uh, talks, etc. And also we uh, try to invite um, speakers and mentors and um, panelists that are strong role models, mo role models for the community to follow. And we, you will see, like, we have a really good lineup of speakers that, uh, for me, they were like role models. Like in, in, and at their time, I like, I want to be them. Like, so I hope you will be as inspired as as I am. So um, fast forward to this year's uh, weekly updates and news. Um, this year, for the first time, weekly has proceedings. So before, it was just a poster session. Um, it was. For me, it was a little bit more like temporary thing that like if we are trying to uh, have visibility, but it's just the poster, and after that, uh, everyone forgets about that. So this year we have proceedings uh, in CVPR, WSVPR workshop. 
Um, which is really good news. Um, thank you again for all the uh, people that sub all of you that submitted papers. Um, second news is uh, this used to be a half day workshop and for the first time now we are having a full day workshop uh, with awesome talks with more uh, keynotes with more oral presentations and with, uh, with more time for us to get to know each other. And uh, finally this year, it's not only CVPR, but it's CVPR and ECCV. Uh, so uh, the fifth week we will be organized this year at ECCV. And we have the announcement that uh, if you want to submit there uh, your work, uh, submission deadline is July 2nd. So everyone here and live stream, um, submit your work to uh, ECCV weekly. Um, it doesn't need to be uh, like the, that really novel graph paper, no, it can be on, uh, ongoing work, it can be uh, published work that you want to increase its visibility, it can be a compilation of your thesis, a summary of your favorite uh, like paper that you published last month, I don't know. So, publish, uh, so submission deadline is approaching. Um, a little bit of workshop stati statistics, as you see, like in 2015, 16, and 17, um, the yellow bars are submissions, greens are accepted, uh, uh, accepted papers and uh, purple is travel grants. Um, and that, that is the proceedings. Um, it is new, so that's why it's only in 2018. Um, anyway, so uh, one thing that I want to uh, emphasize in this one is, you see, like we had papers, we have papers and we had a little bit less of travel grants in previous years. This year, everyone that was accepted we were able to give travel grants to them. So that was awesome news. And again, thanks to sponsors for enabling us to do that. Um, more workshop, workshop statistics because I just said sponsors. <laughs> As you see, like the amount of sponsorships we are getting is really increasing. And thank you for every for all the companies and all, all of our connections that are uh, providing us to give the travel grants, make the banquet, uh, and have those awesome bags around you. Um, by the way, this was uh, when we were compiling the results of the workshop. Um, even after that, even we closed all of our sponsorships, this happened. So it's not even that. <laughs> so we have even more uh, sponsors and even more uh, money to, like, we will adjust the travel grants accordingly, so don't worry about that. Um, and uh, we also want to em emphasize that, like, please reply us when we reach out to you to have all those sponsorship benefits. Anyway, uh, who are we? This year, uh, weekly organizers, I, I, I cannot tell how uh, lucky I was to be in this committee because like this is the perfect balance. Maybe you don't know each of them, but like we have such a good coherent committee this year that everyone complements each other. Like everyone like knows as if like we had that um, implicit division of labor before even we met. So um, Adriana is here uh, from FAIR. Uh, Dana, uh, we are so, so sad that she's not here. Her, her visa was rejected and there was nothing we could do, but um, I know you are watching us. We love you, Thank for, thanks for everything. Uh, then there is me from Facebook and there is Lynn uh, from Stanford and there's Victoria and her baby here also, by the way, I need to say that. <laughs> <laughs> here and uh, thank you like that was I think the best organization committee I have ever been in thank you um, going faster okay this is the schedule we have a full 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 schedule uh, after me we have Jessica Hodgins uh, we have Laura Leal uh, I, I, I did that I'm sorry um, okay then we have oral presentations then we have Octavia Combs and um, then we have oral presentations again, then we will have Carol, uh, and uh, at the end, at 4.30, we will have the interactive panel. And for the panel, uh, this is really a great group of people, incredibly supportive people. And we have two male allies, like Michael Black and Jitendra Malik will also be here for the panel. Um, and Octavia will be here. Dima gave one of the uh, mentorship talks yesterday, Dima Daman from University of Bristol. She will be here. And Shin Lu, also another uh, uh, mentorship speaker from yesterday, she will also be here for the panel. And 
I said it's interactive, right? <laughs> so uh, the ones here in the room can ask here the questions, of course. But if you are on live stream, if you are on Twitter, if you are somewhere watching us, uh, this is the link. And it's also announced in the uh, Twitter page. So this is the link. Ask your anonymous question, just like whatever you are, we want to hear from them. It can be based on their career. It can, it can be based on their experiences, how they support uh, women researchers, etc. So this is the link. Um, so I have a little bit of more talking about all the opportunities around, and I think this is really important to know. So uh, I will start with Facebook Fellowship Program and Emerging Scholar Awards. Uh, so the tuition and fees are paid for two years. Uh, there is a good stipend, and uh, they also provide travel funds. Go to that link for uh, both of the applications, like Fellowship Program or the Emerging S Scholar Awards. Um, Second thing I want to mention is Anita Borg Institute. Uh, they are like the greatest supporter of women in STEM. Um, as most of you hopefully know, there is Grace Hopper Celebration of Women Co in Computing Conference ev every year. And um, we are like 15, I think this year it was like 18,000 women in STEM going uh, and like that's an incredible experience. Uh, I, I would definitely uh, suggest to check that out. There's also sisters and subcommittees of sisters, like um, Turkish women in computing, like uh, black women in computing, like Latinas. Um, all, everyone, uh, like all the subcommittees are really a uh, good support environment again. Uh, there are local groups, and they are also uh, offering grants and fellowships, and there are volunteering open opportunities. So that's the link for Anita Borg. Um, there's also Women Tech Makers. The old Google Anita Borg Memory Scholarship is now converted to Women Tech Makers uh, Scholarship. And they also have some travel awards. So uh, check it out. Women Tech Makers is a good community too. They are like, uh, they are Google based, but they are actually uh, inclusive of everyone. Um, there is ACMW. They have travel grants. They have, uh, they send you to SIGGRAPH if you uh, submit and um, check it out. Uh, there is CRAW, uh, which is which they have a grad cohort of like 500 women researchers, and there are mentorship talks, research talks, etc. Um, for the ones that are in like mid level, uh, mid level of their career, there are discipline specific workshop grants, and um, they are also like that. That's really a good way to if you want to have a local meeting or local conference, etc. They also have travel grants too, so that's the link for CRAW, Computing Research Association with the woman. Yeah. Um, there's also IEEE uh, Women in Engineering. Uh, they also have some local and global conferences, and that's the link for that. Um, okay, going to our sponsors. These are Protein sponsors. Thanks for Facebook, Google, Amazon, NVIDIA, Apple, and Intel. And Facebook was generously our banquet sponsor and uh, our live stream sponsor, so and our volunteers and like they definitely I thank I we can thank more for all the volunteering efforts. Like in addition to the sponsorship, thanks for the volunteering effort that they also put there. Uh, these are our gold sponsors: Toyota, IBM, Microsoft, Uber, and DeepMind. And we also have silver and bronze sponsors. Um, and thank you. So these are all the links that you will need at some point uh, during the workshop. The program is in the website. If you have any questions, send to the Gmail. Uh, follow us from Facebook, Twitter, and join the conversation using the hashtags. Uh, with that, I would like to finish my presentation. And I would like to invite uh, Jessica Hodgins here for her talk. Thanks again, and welcome to Weekly. Our first speaker, uh, Professor Jessica Hodgins. Um, uh, Jessica Hodgins is a professor in the Robo Robotics Institute and Computer Science Department at Carnegie Mellon University. From 2008 to 2016, she founded and ran research labs for Disney, rising to VP of Research and leading the labs in Pittsburgh and Los Angeles. From 2005 to 2015, she was associate director for fa faculty in the Robotics Institute running the promotion and tenure process and creating a mentoring program for pre-tenure faculty. 
Prior to moving to Carnegie Mellon in 2000, she was an associate professor and assistant dean in the College of Computing at Georgia Institute of Technology. She received her PhD in computer science from uh, CMU in 1989. Her research focuses on computer graphics, animations, uh, and robotics with an emphasis on generating and analyzing human motion. She has received an NSF Young Investigator Award, a Packard Fellowship, and a Sloan Fellowship. She was editor-in-chief of ACM Transaction graphic, uh, Transactions and Graphic um, on, from 2000 and 2002, and ACM Seagraph Papers Chair in 2003. She was an elected director at large on the ACM Seagraph Executive Committee from 2012 to 2017, and in 2017, she was elected ACM Seagraph President. In 2010, she was awarded the ACM Seagraph Computer Graphics Achievement Award, and in 2017, she was awarded the Stephen Anson Coons Award for Outstanding Creative Contributions to Graphics. Um, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Jessica Huggins. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm faculty at Carnegie Mellon. I'm also uh, just starting a Facebook AI research lab in Pittsburgh, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, uh, toward the end of the talk. So I set up this talk to be an overview of some of the research that I've done over, say, the past 15 years, but I also wanted to intersperse some thoughts about uh, my career and the decisions that I made in my career and what I've learned sort of on a personal level through my career. So I'm actually going to go way back and uh, start by talking just briefly about uh, my thesis work to give you the context for, for the rest of my research. So for my thesis work, I worked with uh, Mark Raybert on this uh, hopping machine. You know him probably from Boston Dynamics. He's uh, released a, a lot of very amazing robots since then, but you could consider this one and some of the uh, robots of that era to be the ancestors of uh, what the amazing stuff that Boston Dynamics has done since. Uh, so we were writing control algorithms for this. They were in three parts. They controlled how high the machine could jump and where it placed its foot to control forward speed, uh, and, and then a, a balance controller uh, for when the foot was on the ground. Uh, it was a planar biped, obviously. It could only run in a circle, couldn't fall into or out of the circle. Uh, and there, the rope that you see was, uh, uh, there was somebody standing on the other end of it to catch it if it uh, fell, which it did a lot. Uh, so we didn't want to spend too much time repairing it. So one of the more fun projects I did when I was in graduate school was, were these flips. Uh, Boston Dynamics has now made a full, a fully uh, uh, 3D robot do a flip, which is an incredibly impressive feat. But the neat thing about this was that it uh, was a relatively small change to the control algorithm. So the robot threw its nose down to generate the angular velocity, did the flip, and then uh, caught itself uh, with the normal running algorithms, uh, which was actually something I wouldn't have expected would actually work. So throughout the talk, I'm going to have lessons learned. Uh, most of them are going to be on the technical side, but uh, some of them will be on the uh, more personal career side. Uh, so the lessons learned for me from these projects was uh, that simple hand-designed control algorithms worked very well for simple machines. So I recently had the Computer Museum read the tapes from my uh, graduate school uh, code, and it was about 100 lines of code that actually controlled those robots. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff and reading sensors and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But if you had just looked at what was computing the signals that should be sent to the valves, it was about 100 lines of code, which is kind of amazing. Uh, the other key insight in this set of machines was that passive, di passive dynamics really helped to produce the right behavior. So each of those machines uh, had a, a, a passive air spring in it that was in series with a mechanical, uh, with a hydraulic actuator. And if you just turned the machine off but dropped it on the ground, you got a bouncing behavior. So you got sort of 50% of what you wanted out of the passive behaviors out of the machine before you turned on the computer or anything else. Uh, and then the other lesson was uh, substantial computing power wasn't needed. Uh, so we were using very substantial machines. Uh, the one you just saw was running off the VAX uh, 11780, but obviously that's nothing in terms of today's computing power. So we didn't need a lot of computation and the code wasn't very complicated. So switching gears uh, to graphics, which is what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk on, uh, I'm going to divide the work into three buckets. So there's controllers, uh, there's data, and how can we use it to produce animated characters, and then there's uh, 
creating controllers from data, which is some of my more recent work. Uh, so when I started as a faculty member at Georgia Tech, uh, I decided that I wanted to take these control algorithms that we'd made work on the physical hardware, but on, in some sense, very simple physical hardware, and, and make it work on uh, human, simulated humans. So I moved from a couple of degrees of freedom to uh, these much more complicated models like the one on the left. And then we uh, did a project where we, a, a bunch of my graduate students and I, uh, developed a lot of control systems for uh, gymnastic behaviors. And so let me show you uh, part of this video. This was when the uh, Olympics were in Atlanta in 1996. Uh-oh, that's not a good sign. Uh, so uh, we did a, a, a number of different uh, behaviors, gymnastics and diving and things like that. Uh, and here's some examples of diving. all the way through. So the key issue with this work was where are we going to get the control systems from? So for the, the physical robots with just a couple of degrees of freedom, we could sort of think through from first principles where those control laws should come from. But it was a lot harder for the humans characters with 30 or 40 degrees of freedom. And now we think about 60 or 80 degrees of freedom or more for these human characters. Uh, so this was before the era when mocap data was readily available in academia. Uh, so we uh, spent a lot of time looking at people, so observation of people. Um, we got people to run on a treadmill and tried to see if their running was at all similar to uh, the running motion that we were simulating. Uh, we did use our physical intuition about the problem, so that goes back to what was the techniques that were used in those robots. Uh, and then we also talked about using optimization uh, but at that point, we really didn't have the tools to do it for a complicated system. So, uh, or at least, at least my lab didn't have the tools. So the graphics field was thinking about optimization, but it was really thinking about optimization for things like a jumping Luxo lamp, so many fewer degrees of freedom. So we relied a lot on hand tuning uh, and observation uh, of people, as well as uh, reading the biomechanics uh, literature. So what did we learn from this uh, set of projects? Uh, one was that control systems uh, for human characters were really hard to design. Uh, and another, which I, I think I'm still wrestling with, is uh, that we don't have a language for the stylistic subtleties of human motion. And then finally, our standards for human motion are very high, and particularly when the character is fully rendered. So if you render out a, a fleshed out character rather than a sort of skeleton version of a character, uh, everybody's uh, threshold for what they'll think is acceptable goes way up. Uh, we have a much higher standards. And there's another observation here, which is that everybody can tell me what's wrong with those characters. Uh, and often they're not right, uh, so they'll tell me that the physics is wrong. And I know the physics isn't wrong, right? I'm running a good physical simulator, so that's not the issue. But we really weren't able, uh, by designing these hand, hand designing these control laws, to get something that captured the strategies that people use to perform these tasks. Uh, so that's something that I've been working on and thinking about through the intervening years. Uh, the other lesson here on the personal side is that you can move into a new area. So I did my PhD thesis in robotics, and when I started as a faculty member, uh, I decided to move, well, through a postdoc, and when I started as a faculty member, I moved into graphics and thought more about animating human characters instead of uh, building physical robots. So I think it's, an, it's important to recognize that uh, many people do change their direction of their research every seven, 10 years, something like that. Uh, and that's perfectly okay, and it's actually a really exciting uh, time when you change direction. So, as I said, the control laws for human characters were really hard to design. So in about 2000, when I moved from Georgia Tech to CMU, uh, it also became possible to buy uh, motion capture systems in academia. The price had come down enough that that was a reasonable thing to do. So uh, I built a, when I moved to CMU, I built a motion capture lab, uh, which you can see here, and uh, got our first system. Uh, so this was going to serve as domain knowledge for animating human characters. And the first set of projects that we did with that were kinematic rather than dynamic with control systems. Uh, but so I'm going to tell you briefly about those and then about um, 
uh, some of the more recent ones with, uh, with physics in them. Uh, so here we're uh, asking somebody to walk around in the lab. You can see the video uh, there. He's stepping onto those blocks. Uh, there are various different heights. Uh, you might notice that he's very carefully turning 90 degrees each time he turns. He's not going diagonal across those blocks. And that was to keep the uh, set of data that we needed in order to accomplish this task uh, simple enough. So uh, we built out of this a, a technique that's since become uh, called motion graphs. And the basic idea is really simple. Uh, you have the original uh, trajectories of the motion. That's the green, red, and blue lines, and then you look for similar poses by some definition of similar, and that gives you a graph structure, and then you can search that graph structure to it, um, accomplish a particular task. And let me see if I can get this one to play again. Uh, so here, uh, he's walking in a much expanded version of the terrain, uh, but it's you know similar to the terrain that the human was walking on originally, uh, and the target is that green, or that pink circle there. Uh, so he's trying to get to that. Uh, and actually, it does pretty well. It, it will never diagonalize across the terrain, of course, because that's not in the database. Uh, but it was very efficient to search in the space of human motion that we had actually captured. So the lessons from this are that databases don't need to be nearly as big as I would have guessed. Uh, so when we were doing this walking work, we were collecting databases of about five minutes, and that was sufficient to, to span a pretty broad space of what people do when they're walking. And then the other key observation, and you have to remember the time we were doing this work, but uh, so searching in the space of human motion of the 60 degrees of freedom or whatever it was, uh, wasn't really a tractable thing to do, but because we were planning or searching just in the space of what we had recorded and the data we'd recorded in the lab, it was very efficient and these uh, were actually working in essentially real time uh, and would easily work, trivially work in real time now. Uh, so the next project is to take two of those motion graphs and interpolate between them in order to be able to get more optimal motion and much more precise motion. So with the original motion graph work, you'd sometimes see the character dither around a little bit as he tried to find a path through the graph that would line him up correctly with an obstacle or something like that. Uh, so Ala Safanova did her PhD work uh, on interpolating two of those uh, graphs. So the specification of the problem was a sketch of the path, where, was, where the character was starting, where she was going to end up, and the path that she was going to follow. And then you could see motion, uh, then the system could find motion like this. Oops. Could find motion like this, where uh, it follows the path, uh, hops between these things when it is too big to take a step, but when it's possible to actually just take a step and duck under that bar, then the character does that. And that's all data that's in the database. So we're finding essentially two paths through that graph and then interpolating between them to get more precise uh, control. Uh, and there were a lot of other uh, examples from this work. So this was a very simple one, but where the character started on that pink circle and then went to uh, touch the ball in space. And uh, the algorithm that we were using could, would return uh, suboptimal solutions along the way and then an optimal solution uh, at the end. So the suboptimal solutions, I think, are kind of interesting because they look like strategies that people would use, but only if it was a more constrained environment. Uh, so you know, she bends over too far in the upper left-hand corner. She's sort of bent in a kind of awkward sideways uh, position on the right-hand side. And then the optimal solution looks like the solution that you would use if you were doing this in an unconstrained uh, space. And here are just another, a couple of other examples. And again, I think it's significant that the character you know, steps when it's appropriate, when the blocks are close enough, hops when they're not. Uh, and that's all just falling out from the data and the, and the optimal search. So it, the lessons from this were that optimality was very important, uh, as we defined it, for the appearance of natural looking motion. So the solutions we would get along the way to finding that optimal solution were not as natural looking in an unconstrained environment. Uh, and then uh, the other observation was this, this class of approaches worked really well for uh, things that had contact, so locomotion and, and path planning for those kinds of problems. Uh, but we're going to need something different when we're looking at more stylistic and dynamic motions. And I have a PhD student right now who's 
uh, looking at, at how generating conversations and what do we do in terms of eye gaze and gesture and things like that. And so this is, this brings home the fact that you can't think about contact events like footfalls and things like that when you're talking about these uh, less dynamic and more stylistic motions, right? We can, we can gesture any way that we want. It's not a matter of energy consumption or dynamics. Uh, as it is if you're you know, trying to do a backflip or something like that. And then the other observation is we're going to need new evaluation techniques for stylistic motion. So here I can uh, easily compare to what a reasonable person would have done in that situation. But once you're trying to do these stylistic things, we all have different ways of gesturing. And so we're going to need new evaluation uh, techniques for that. Uh, so now I want to switch gears to thinking about uh, bringing together uh, data uh, with generating control systems. So we're going to go back to having a full simulation and, uh, and trying to use the data to inform that. Uh, so I just want to briefly tell you about our first foray into this, and then I'll tell you about some more recent work. So uh, in this uh, First attempt at this, we were we developed something that we called momentum mapped inverted pendulum models. So we were doing analysis of motion capture data that's represented on the top. We turned the full human motion into this pendulum, this sort of a odd in, inverted pendulum. It was always on the ground, but it represented the physical state of the character. Uh, and then we could synthesize from that simple model of an inverted pendulum up to the full model that's represented by the middle. And then we ran a big optimization process uh, that was basically based on trajectory optimization to figure out how to get a particular dynamic model to perform these tasks like running. And, and also we went back to gymnastics with this. Uh, those optimizations ran for a long time, a couple of days. Uh, the results that they produced were in many ways pretty brittle. I mean, they were somewhat resistant to forces and things like that, but they also uh, weren't generalizable in the sense that they were only capable of doing uh, one behavior. So here's a, here's a few examples. So a handstand walk, that's the captured motion. This is the simulated motion. So it's a little stiffer. It ends up uh, not being as compliant appearing as the mocap data. That's the original mocap. That's the simulated motion. Uh, and again, it's a, it's a good reproduction. It's physically correct, um, but it doesn't have a ton of generality in it. So it's a different optimization running for every one of these behaviors that I'm showing you. That's again a captured motion. The purple is the captured motion every time, and the yellow is the simulated. And you could see there was a little bit of a, I mean, the awkwardness of the balancing came from the original mocap, but, the, uh, but there was a little bit of uh, uh, too stiffness, I, too much stiffness, I guess. So uh, more recently, over the last couple of years, I've been working with Lee Bin Lu to try and learn motion controllers. Uh, so the key insight in this work was that we could uh, grab little fragments, little, we call them control fragments, but basically we could build, using techniques similar to what I just talked about, we could build a working control system for behavior, but it would again be very brittle. And then we could chop that up arbitrarily into these little pieces of point, Oh, 0.05 seconds or 0.1 seconds, something like that. So a very small piece. And then learn uh, using, uh, we use Q networks in this one, but I think lots of other approaches would work. Uh, learn how to reorder them based on the state of the system at a particular moment. Uh, and this was amazingly powerful. I actually never would have predicted that this would be as powerful as it was. I would have thought that, you know, these little control fragments, totally arbitrary, based on, broken up just based on time, uh, I wouldn't have thought that reordering them would be as, uh, as powerful as it was. Uh, and here's a few examples. Uh, so she's doing a bongo board. Uh, the yellow arrows indicate that she's being pushed on by an external force. Uh, she's able to put the board on the ground and then pick it up again and get back to balancing. That was something we'd never been able to do because that's a significant change to the dynamics. Uh, here, the yellow arrow indicates the direction that she's trying to skateboard in. She can push off the ground, so again, that's a change in the physics. And almost all the time, to me, this looks like pretty natural human motion. 
Uh, now there was a little thing there, so when we run her over bumps and things like that, or when we ask her to do things a little bit too quickly, uh, she sometimes doesn't have the right control fragments to substitute in. So I think if we could do a little bit broader uh, database of control fragments, then I think we'd have a little bit better motion. And this is uh, walking on a ball, and again, we're telling her here to change direction, which she can do, but only a little bit slowly, since it's actually a pretty hard tax to walk on, a, on a, one of those big circus balls, as it turns out. So what was the lesson here? And I, I think the most important lesson was the power that we could get from these control snippets. I mean, uh, if Lieben hadn't forced me into doing this approach, I probably would have said, oh, you know, it's very important that we have a control fragment that works for a whole s segment of the motion between contacts, and I wouldn't have thought that breaking it up into these tiny little pieces and reordering it uh, was going to be nearly as powerful as it was. And we were aided, of course, by all the advances in uh, machine learning that have occurred since, since the start of my talk. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> and it, it, it was amazing how being able to reorder these control fragments uh, allowed the character to be so much more robust. It's still only working on one behavior. The training still took a long time, uh, but it was really much, much more robust to these forces that we throw at it or to the changes in direction and things like that. Uh, so the next project I want to talk about is very recent work, so it will be presented at SIGGRAPH this summer. Uh, and this is, it's also work with Lee Bin, and uh, here we split up the, the control into two problems. So we're going to look at basketball dribbling and tricks like that. Uh, and so uh, we split it up into locomotion control, which we sort of already knew how to solve, and then the arm control, which was uh, the new part, and, and how do you manipulate the ball to make it a controlled dribble. Uh, so one of the insights here was that, or one of the goals here was that we wanted to be able to learn transitions between uh, skills. So we wanted to be able to say, well, there's a cyclic skill of just dribbling in place, and then there are these non-cyclic skills, and we wanted to be able to run transitions between them and to, to learn all of those uh, transitions. So let me just show you a few examples here. So this is uh, learning the, the basic cyclic behavior, so just dribbling. manipulating the ball. And then we can uh, go on to combine those together so he can move around uh, while dribbling. Do the tricks like dribbling between the legs. Jump ahead a little here. And then this is uh, dribbling, but while trying to run in a particular direction. So decoupling the control system into locomotion and the arm motion, in this case dribbling, turned out to be a really powerful way to make the problem tractable. We tried initially to learn everything at once, uh, and we weren't able to come up with techniques that would do that. But by taking sort of existing techniques for producing locomotion controllers and combining them with uh, uh, controllers for the, learned controllers for the arm motion, uh, we were able to make the problem tractable. Uh, and then we were able to learn two behaviors simultaneously. We would learn first the cyclic behavior to get that one nailed, pretty much nailed down, and then adjust it just a little bit while learning a second behavior. So the, you know, the dribbling, the cyclic behavior then combined with running or, or uh, one of the other tricks. So the last uh, thing I was going to talk about, and I'll, I'll try and do this pretty quickly, is that all the work I've talked about so far, we've been doing capture just of rigid body models. Uh, and those are actually kind of a lie. <laughs> so, and I think this is important for the vision community too, because you're thinking about capturing much more detailed uh, models of human motion now. So the video on the left is an x-ray video, uh, and that circle that you can see moving significantly with respect to the knee joint, that's a marker. So that's what I would have considered to be a fixed point with respect to the joint and my motion capture data. Yet in this person running uh, or hopping, 
uh, that marker is moving a lot. It's moving a couple of inches with respect to that joint. The other thing which isn't so apparent in this video is that the knee joint is not a perfect pivot joint, but instead uh, is, a, is a joint that rotates, uh, the center of rotation moves substantially. And then this is a high-speed video of somebody running, and you can see a lot of flex in her feet, her, feet her toes bounce a little bit, there's a sort of traveling wave that goes up her leg uh, as she's running. So there are all these details in human motion that we are just throwing away when we say that we're gonna reduce the motion to this um, skeleton, which isn't really a skeleton either. So we did do a project where we uh, put 400 markers onto people and tried to capture some of that motion. Uh, so let me, I'll just show you one or two examples of this. So somebody jump rope, and then the motion that we were able to capture from that. Uh, the hard problem here was tracking the 400 markers and building models to reconstruct the markers that we couldn't see, which was of course many of the markers. We did belly dancing. We did a few other styles of dancing. And we did people with different body types. So what did we learn from this? Uh, I think the skin and muscle deformations really matter for realism, so just using these linear skinning models as we usually do in graphics uh, really isn't enough to produce a, a realistic human model. And you know, using the technique that we had at the time, which was putting 400 markers onto people, we could capture and model some of those deformations, and we could build models of those deformations and then uh, apply them to other skeletal motion and things like that. Uh, it's very hard to find, uh, 400, find subjects when you want to put 400 markers onto them because it's not a particularly pleasant experience. So I'm really excited to see the work that's going on now uh, in trying to capture these much more detailed uh, models of people uh, and the shape of people as they move and, and do behaviors. And I think it's, it's going to be exciting to see what we can do with that, that data. Uh, so to summarize, uh, I think from my research career, I've learned that priors about human motion are very effective uh, in either reducing the search space uh, or the optimization space or the machine learning space uh, now. Uh, they can come in in the form of raw data or it can come in in the form of models. Uh, physics is a really helpful constraint, uh, particularly for things like contacts and, and angular momentum conser conservation and all those sort of the easy physics, physical things. Um, but we need much more than that. We need optimality to push human motion toward the naturalness, toward getting the characters to do the motion in the style that they should be doing it in. Uh, and none of those three things, either the priors of human motion, the physics, or the optimality are really sufficient, especially when we want to think about less dynamic and more stylistic motions. So I think for my field, that's the real challenge, is to figure out how to to build models that can capture uh, the style of the way people move. Uh, and the question that I'd pose to the group, and maybe we can talk about it during the breaks, is you know, very soon we're gonna be able to record everything, uh, at least at some level of detail, and that's through thanks to the techniques that are coming out of this community. And so what are we, how are we gonna be able to leverage and use that data effectively? And, and that's, one of the questions that I really want to look at as I build this, this uh, AI lab for Facebook. So two more personal lessons. You want to work with great people. Uh, so these are the various labs I've worked with over the years. Uh, the Facebook lab is uh, just starting, so there aren't enough of us to take a picture yet. Uh, but um, I, we are hiring, so I'm happy to talk to people about that during the break. Uh, I'm really excited about the kinds of problems that we're going to be able to work on in this context. Uh, and then the last lesson is remember to have fun. Uh, this was a video that I shot at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. Uh, just before I defended my thesis. Uh, so we did it at 2 a.m. because we didn't want the security guards walking in on us. Uh, and we spent a lot of time outside uh, figuring out what burned and what would burn long enough to be able to uh, actually shoot this video. So my thesis work was on rough terrain locomotion, which often means the, the robot needs to line itself up with an obstacle, and in this case it was lining itself up with a flaming hoop or a flaming, flaming sea, I guess. 
Uh, and so it was a real test of, uh, of my thesis work to uh, be able to do this. But I think it's very important to remember to have fun with your research. So that's the lesson I wanted to leave you with. Thank you. That was an example of, uh, an early example of sharing, which has become a, a common thing, but I, set, I think it set an example for everybody and it really pushed the field forward. So, um, but I have a question. And uh, you pointed out, for example, with the Olympic videos that, that the physics was right. And then you later showed us that uh, maybe the models of the body were not quite right, the feet and all of the details and the soft tissue. So is it, do you think the path forward is to really get the body and, and, and its, its true structure and all kinds of detail and then do physics simulation? Or is that gonna just be just un, unwieldy? So. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And, and maybe the answer is that we wanna first find control systems that work on very simple rigid body models and then uh, find ways to add the extra things to them. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of the jiggle and, you know, the traveling wave that I talked about in that slow motion video, I think those kinds of things can be added in after the fact. What may be much harder to deal with is uh, things like delays in the human control system. So, I mean, we do a lot to anticipate what we're about to do, and so then there's effectively no delay, but uh, but we also react to things, and when we react to things, you know, it has to go up from the sensors to the spinal cord or the brain and back down again, and that's a very long period of time, actually, in terms of a control system. And I suspect that if we're really going to get natural-looking motion in response to disturbances, we're going to need to model that, and it may be very hard to go from the perfect rigid body models to uh, ones that have that kind of delay. Uh, so all the work that I've done, we've assumed that there's no sensor delay, no uh, response delay at all, and that's probably what makes things look too stiff some of the time. So I have a question about um, the motion that you captured uh, in uh, rough terrains. So you mentioned that you imposed a constraint on the motion of the human so that they could not rotate uh, by anything other than 90 degrees. But in, um, for the athletes, it, it doesn't seem that there was any constraint imposed um, for that. So why, was, why were there constraints in the first case? What made it challenging to capture anything that wasn't a 90 degree rotation? So we easily could have captured it. There wasn't any problem with the capture. The thing we were scared about was uh, planning in too high dimensional a space. So if you're just saying, well, the character can only turn 90 degrees, then at each moment, when it's making a decision about what way to go, well, it can you know, only go a couple of directions straight and to the left and to the right. Whereas if you can go diagonal, then your space is continuous and much, much larger. Uh, so it was really a concern about the size of the space that we were gonna be planning in that, that led us to that decision. And I think you might well be able to relax that now. Thank you very much for the talk. I wonder if you've uh, done any work on people who change their mind as they attempt motion? So they start the motion and then change their mind? And what are your thoughts on that? I think that's a great question. Uh, so I guess before we did the control fragments work, uh, there's, been, there's an experiment that I've wanted to run for many years and I've never quite gotten it together to do it. But it's essentially uh, to try and figure out how to disturb people while they're, op while they're walking or something like that in the lab. And other you know, biomechanics folks and so on have done work in this work trying to do this as well. But the, the problem with just using the raw motion capture data is you only have that one trajectory, right? You, had, you brought somebody into the lab, they stood up straight, they walked the way that they think they're supposed to walk, and you have only that trajectory, and you have no idea what happened, what would have happened had they stumbled a little bit or scuffed a foot or any of those things. Uh, so, you know, I really would love to do a capture that uh, you know, that tries to disturb people uh, while they're walking by giving them targets that you flash on or, um, or something like that. We have done some work on slipping and tripping 
uh, people in the lab, which is uh, it's a hard to get IRB approval for that, but you have to, with the right safety harnesses and stuff, you can do it. So anyway, I think, yes, knocking people off their preferred path is a really important thing. And uh, I do think it's become a little bit less important now that I understand how powerful it is to rearrange these control snippets, because effectively that's what you're doing, right? Instead of saying, you know, this was exactly the thing I was going to do next, you say, you know, well, let's hop to the control snippet, you know, a second or, a you know, a tenth of a second in advance when the foot touches down too early or something like that. So the, I think a combination of those two things would be really powerful. So, yeah, that's a great question. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Professor Ogden. Um, I will now introduce our next speaker while uh, she's setting up. So um, Professor Laura Leal Tache is leading the Dynamic Vision and Learning Group at the Technical University of Munich, Germany. She received a bachelor and master's degree in telecommunication engineering from the Technical University of Catalonia, Barcelona. She did a master's thesis at Northeastern University, Boston, and received her PhD degree from the Leibniz University, Hanover, Germany. During her PhD, she did a one-year visit at the Vision Lab at, uh, at the University of Michigan, she also spent two years as a postdoc at the Institute of Geodesy and Photogrammetry of ETH Zurich, Switzerland, and one year at the Technical University of Munich. Her research interests are dynamic scene understanding, in particular multiple object tracking and segmentation, as well as machine learning for video analysis. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Loa Liao Tashi. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, and thank you to the organization for inviting me. I'm really super excited to be here. And um, even though I'm really interested in, in object tracking and segmentation, as, as was commented, um, today I want to talk a bit about a, a different thing. Uh, but first, since it's really, really new, I want to say like a couple of words of my new group in Munich. So the group is called Dynamic Vision and Learning. So we're interested in dynamic scenes, videos in particular, and of course, uh, machine learning, using machine learning for uh, video scene understanding. And uh, I would like to start by motivating a little bit what we're interested in with the project that uh, I recently got accepted called Social Maps. Um, so the, the goal of this project is to um, kind of enhance the, uh, the information that is present in current maps. So currently we have really excellent static information um, such as roads, uh, shops and restaurants. You can really find anything that you want uh, at Google Maps or OpenStreetMaps. But there is currently quite a limited amount of dynamic information. And this dynamic information is essentially limited to something like traffic reports. So there is a congestion somewhere, and uh, once you're already on the road and you're already in the traffic jam, you're notified that there's a traffic jam. So that's uh, actually not so useful. And uh, what I would like to capture is actually pedestrian patterns, so how people use public spaces, and include this social information into maps. Um, so to me, there are certainly many advantages to having this social information included into maps. So one of them uh, in the short term is actually decoupling pedestrian traffic from vehicle traffic. So let's assume that I want to go uh, from my home in Munich to my workplace, which is actually not in Munich, but a little bit outside. And so um, recently I bought a car and I put on Google Maps and uh, Google Maps tells me that I should follow this route to best go to my workplace. But um, if we had a camera somewhere in the middle of the route, and uh, we could actually detect that there's an unusual crowd, so let's say possible demonstration. Um, and I have to be fair, this is not Munich, actually. Um, so this is an image of India. So Munich, it doesn't look like that at all. But you will see at ECCV, hopefully, you can all make it uh, in September. But let's assume that um, we are actually able um, to, to detect um, automatically what is happening with a uh, camera. Um, and then maybe. Uh, my algorithm could tell me it's an optimized route, the route that actually avoids all this uh, pedestrian congestion and allows me to actually separate the vehicle traffic from the people traffic. 
Now, of course, in the long term, uh, there's all sorts of things that one can do if um, we actually can analyze how pedestrians use public spaces, and that is actually to improve those public spaces, so to really make cities better uh, for pedestrians. And um, the reason also that I'm super happy and super excited about this project is because um, I was awarded the Sofia Kovaleskaya Award last year, and it's quite a substantial amount of money, so this allowed me to already start hiring PhDs and doing cool research. And so um, in the, with this motivation of the social maps and dynamic scene understanding, um, I started my group uh, in learning to understand dynamic scenes. So we do a little bit of uh, multiple object tracking, which was the topic of my PhD thesis. Um, we are also interested in uh, segmentation and semantic segmentation. Oops. Um, oh yeah. Um, there's also a couple of students now working on, on more theoretical machine learning, improving network generalization. Uh, but at the topic I want to talk about today is the topic of visual localization. And one of the reasons I picked this topic is because uh, we recently had an ECCB submission by my first female PhD student, so I'm really proud um, to actually present this work here, and I hope that she will attend the, the Women in Computer Vision workshop at ECCV. Um, so let me just um, start by a little bit motivating and presenting what is actually visual localization. So um, let's assume that we take a picture, uh, we are in a new city, we take a picture, and we actually want to know exactly where we are located. And not only uh, with a GPS accuracy, but actually to place the camera in 3D in, in the scene model of the city. Um, so this would be um, a reconstruction that we can make of the city using uh, various structure from motion models, um, algorithms, sorry, and then we can place our camera, which is actually um, the pink uh, triangle, and we want to pinpoint the exact location within this map. Um, so in classical localization, uh, what you would do is uh, you would first extract some sort of local features, sift or surf, um, then you would establish matches between the local features and the 3D model, and finally you would estimate the camera pose in a robust way using some sort of Ransack algorithm. So, well, this is actually a really um, powerful tool. People have started to ask uh, whether we can actually learn to perform the whole visual localization pipeline directly with neural networks. So of course there's a huge advantage that training data is sort of for free. So we can run our structure from motion algorithm and this gives us plenty of data. So plenty of uh, 3D points reconstructed of the city and plenty of already localized camera poses. And now what we can do is we can trade some of these camera poses for training and some of these camera poses for testing and we can train our network to do um, visual localization. So perhaps um, the most uh, famous related work uh, in this area is PoseNet. Uh, so in PoseNet, uh, we directly uh, want to learn the pose of the camera using CNN. So first we take our image, the query image that we want to localize and we essentially obtain this uh, 2048 vector, which is a nonlinear embedding. And from that, we want to perform directly linear regression. So we want to obtain the position of the camera, which is this three-valued vector, and the quaternion, which expresses the orientation. Now, uh, when this work was presented, so this is quite recent, 2015, um, of course, there was the hype of neural networks, so people were really excited. Uh, but what happened eventually is that um, all these new methods based on CNNs actually were not comparing to classical methods. So at ICCV in 2017, we decided to make such a thorough comparison with one of the state-of-the-art algorithm, um, classical algorithms. And so uh, we took PostNet and the data set it was working with, which are um, the Cambridge landmarks, and we actually compared it with a sieve based method. And if we look actually at the average performance, we see that it really cannot match these um, classical methods. Of course, this makes sense. So it's been something like 10, 15 years that these uh, SIF-based methods have been developed. So they are actually quite robust. But now the question was, um, why do we actually need these learning-based methods when we are perfectly capable of localizing cameras much more accurately with classic methods? Uh, for other localization, we can say that actually CIF-based methods uh, win. Uh, 
Um, so we turn um, to analyze also indoor scenes. Um, so there is um, the, the seven scenes data set, which is also quite used for visual localization. And in this case, we already see an interesting trend. So we see that um, what we did here was uh, we also uh, counted the number of images that the sieve based method was not able to localize. And in this case, the sieve based method just gives us zero position. So it says, well, I'm not able to localize reliably, so I'm not gonna give you any position. And you can see that for some of the data sets like pumpkin, pumpkin or red kitchen, um, this is actually quite a significant, no, sorry, uh, office and pumpkin. Um, this is quite a significant number of images. So it's something like 50% of the images. Um, so if we take into account that SIFT is more accurate, but at the same time, it cannot localize half of the images, this is quite already um, an interesting place where CNN-based methods could actually have an impact. Um, so actually these indoor scenes are pretty small. So we wanted to kind of boost the problem and say, well, what if we take a really large indoor scene and we compare sieve based methods and CNN-based methods. So uh, we propose this new data set also at ICCV uh, called the TOM uh, Large Scale Indoor Data Set. And in this, uh, we recorded um, kind of large parts of the building. And um, the interesting thing here is that sieve based methods do not work at all. And the reason is that, um, as you can see here, some of the examples of these scenes um, you have quite um, textureless surfaces, um, a lot of repetitive structures, so you have stairs that are completely symmetric. And so if you run state-of-the-art structure for motion algorithms, it's really hard to get a reconstruction because there are not enough features and these features are actually not really distinctive. So what happens is that, first of all, we cannot get a 3D reconstruction. And second of all, uh, once this reconstruction is done, you cannot really uh, run any sieve based methods because you don't have enough features. And as you can see with the CNN based method, uh, we get a pretty decent accuracy, so it's still not at the level of um, sieve based methods outdoors, but it's actually quite competitive considering that it's a scene that could not be handled before. So this is um, a scenario where we see like a potential impact of CNN based methods for visual localization, um, but still, current methods have quite some limitations. So the first and most important one is that um, you're required to have to train one separate network for each scene where you want to localize yourself. So this applies to the PostNet um, algorithm that I've presented, but also more state-of-the-art algorithms like DSAC. Um, there's also an extension that was presented here at this CVPR, I'm not gonna talk about that. But in any case, uh, both methods require to train one network per scene where you want to localize yourself. So this is clearly not scalable. Uh, and another thing that is actually um, quite, uh, quite a problem is that there is this loss function, uh, which has a hyperparameter that I will present more in detail afterwards. And this is again scene dependent. So essentially, the main limitation of current methods is that they do not scale. So if you have to train a network per scene, then it means that for each new scene where you want to localize, and this can be a single building or a city, you actually have to build your model, train your network, et cetera, et cetera. So this is clearly not scalable. Uh, but let me talk a little bit more about the second point. So um, in PostNet and all subsequent works, um, there is a, a very simple L2 loss function uh, that is used where you actually want to compute the loss between your post label and your post prediction. And it essentially boils down to um, an L2 loss function on the camera center position, so these three valued vector, and the camera quaternion. So um, of course you can argue that um, this is not the true quaternion distance, and in fact they did try um, to compute the actual proper quaternion distance. Uh, it did not help much uh, for the training procedure, so this is why um, the L2 loss was, uh, was chosen. But the important critical point here is this, uh, this beta, which seems to be quite harmless, but it's actually a super important scaling factor between these two parts of the loss function. And we actually do need to find this value per scene. 
And this can range uh, from 200 to 2,500. So it, it's really quite a large uh, grid search that you have to do for each scene and for each network that you want to train. Um, the other negative point that I find in this loss function is that there's actually no geometry information. So essentially we're dealing with a geometry problem. We do know how multiple view geometry works, uh, but we're not inputting any of the information here. Um, so in fact, they had this, uh, this follow-up work uh, of the PostNet authors in which they did compute a geometric loss function. And this boiled down essentially to minimizing the reprojection error of the 3D points of the model that were visible in the image. And this did indeed give more accurate results, um, but still the network needs to be pre-trained on the L2 loss, so it could not converge directly with this loss. And we still have the major problem of having one network per scene. Um, now the problem of having one network per scene is due to the fact that we're actually trying to predict the absolute pose of the camera. And so other people um, have started to look into actually predicting relative poses. So you do have a bunch of um, training images, training camera poses that you're using to create your model and to train your network. So why not training a network to predict relative poses with respect to these um, training images? So there was the work at an ICCV workshop in 2007 um, that follow, follow started um, to look into this path, but still uh, was using the PostNet L2 loss. So it had the great advantage that you could use one network for all scenes, uh, but at the same time, you still had this scene-dependent hyperparameter. So this is kind of a counterintuitive thing because uh, one beta is not gonna work for all scenes. So your network is not truly general. Um, so to actually overcome these um, current limitations of, uh, of current methods, um, we, uh, we actually started to work on, first of all, working with relative pose estimation because this is the only way to truly create uh, one network for uh, localization in all scenes. And at the same time, uh, we uh, propose to introduce a little bit of geometry in it. So the main advantage is that um, now you can have one network for localization, uh, but we still need to deal with the hyperparameter. And so for this, we actually propose to uh, regress the essential matrix, uh, which is hyperparameter free. So um, we now can say that we, uh, we can have a method where we can have one network to localize in all scenes, and we don't really need to bother uh, about these hyperparameters. So it's, um, it's a truly general method. So let me just briefly present you what, this, uh, what the method is about. So first of all, uh, we want to perform a relative pose estimation. And uh, in order to do this, we actually need to compare two images. So we want to um, compute the relative pose between two images. So it kind of makes sense. Um, it's a natural choice that we, would, uh, that we would go for a Siamese architecture where we actually have uh, the input pair of images and uh, we pass them through this network with shared weights. And then what we do is we essentially have feature concatenation and uh, we're able to use now these features for um, relative pose prediction. Now we could of course directly um, regress the pose from that in a pose net fashion, but um, we actually wanted to mimic a little bit what is happening with classic localization methods where you first extract the features and then you perform a matching step. So for this we propose to use um, a geometric matching layer. So the matching layer was used in previous works for um, optical flow, for um, actually, um, how's it called, um, to localize yourself in the sense of uh, finding the nearest neighbor uh, of the images that, that you have, for example, of a city or even in the scale of the world, uh, image retrieval. Um, so we actually said, well, we can use the exact same idea. And how this works is essentially, uh, you have your features from the Siamese network, and now you pass them through a matching layer. And this matching layer is nothing else than um, taking feature one from image one and feature one from image two, and just multiplying them and summing up the numbers. So essentially for each feature vector, Fy and Fj, you will obtain one value that compares these two feature vectors. So essentially what you want to do is you want to have a matching score between each pair of features. 
So what this creates is this matrix um, that contains all these matching scores that compares all these features. The nice thing is that this is a completely fixed operation, so there are no learnable parameters, so we're not making our network much, much larger because we don't have so much data as we might think. And then um, there is a kind of a reshaping step so that in, in the end we have this, um, this feature vector. So now with this, uh, we are ready to uh, make our prediction, to make a relative uh, pose estimation. Um, and now the only thing that we need to think of is how do we actually define the loss function? So remember, we wanted to get rid of this parameter. So what we propose is actually um, to go back to multiple view geometry and take the essential matrix, which essentially gives you the relative pose between two cameras. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to compute an L2 loss function on the entries of this essential matrix. Now, one important thing is that uh, we do need to fix the scale of translations, because otherwise uh, we would not get coherent essential matrices. But once we have done that, we have a loss that is completely hyperparameter free. And so we're ready to train our network for relative pose estimation. Now, um, if you come from uh, the 3D world, you might say that an L2 loss on the entries on the essential matrix might actually give you complete um, matrices that are not actually essential matrices. So essential matrices do have some properties. And we're not enforcing any of these properties specifically. So now the question is, um, are we really getting an essential matrix out of our network? So the first property of the essential matrix is that the ratio between the first two eigenvalues has to be close to one. So we actually plot for each of the data sets that we're working with, indoor and outdoor, uh, we plot this relationship and we do see that for most of the cases we are between 0 0.9 and 1. So we can say that this is a pretty close approximation. Um, now the second uh, condition that has to be fulfilled is now that the third eigenvalue has to be close to 0. So we again plot um, this third eigenvalue and we see that indeed it has quite um, low values, so mostly below 0 0.05. So we consider that this is also a good approximation. And in the end, um, we get actually um, a good approximation of a true essential matrix with our network. Um, but we also have to think that um, going back to feature-based, sieve-based classic methods, um, there's also a bunch of noise present in the reconstructions in all the process. Um, so there's also a step in which um, they do get the essential matrix and they project it to this rank two matrix. Um, so to a matrix that fulfills all the conditions that I've talked about before. And so we thought, well, um, we can try to do the same thing with the matrices that we get out of our network. Uh, but we saw that actually forcing this projection does not have any effect on any of the data sets um, that we tested. So we can now say that our network is predicting a good approximation of essential matrices that actually give us um, good results and actually uh, run to essential matrices. So once we know how to perform relative pose estimation, we need to come up with a full pipeline for localization. So um, we start with our query image, and the first thing that we need to do is we need to find all the pairs of images that we have in our training set um, that could be mostly related to our query image. So for this, we can, um, there are really good uh, CNN models for image retrieval. So we get um, the 30 nearest neighbors to the query image with that. And now essentially we perform relative pose estimation with respect to these 30 nearest neighbors with, uh, with our proposed method. So now when we have that, uh, we can take advantage of um, the classic triangulation and so uh, we can triangulate the positions and average the rotation, and even do that in a ransack loop to get rid of outliers. So once we do that, uh, we obtain the absolute camera pose, um, and so we are able to localize um, the camera in the, in the 3D map. Um, so I will talk just briefly about uh, a bit of experiments. Uh, so we do want to test on the Cambridge landmarks, which is uh, kind of the data set mostly used for uh, CNN-based uh, visual localization methods. Um, so we, we compared to a bunch of those, but let me just um, distill a bit the results. 
So um, our method, which is on the far right, um, is actually um, quite comparable to state of the art in uh, positional error, but actually has a much better rotational error. And uh, if we focus only on uh, rotational errors, then um, the method with the geometric loss that I talked about before is actually more accurate, but at the same time, we're more accurate in translation. Um, so we can say that we're more or less on par with state of the art, uh, but now the big thing is that um, for all these methods that we compared with, um, there is actually one network that is trained for each of the scenes. So there are four networks and each of the networks is localizing on one of the scenes. While for us, we train a single network and we're able to obtain uh, these localization results. So uh, for us, this is actually a far bigger advantage than to get really um, state of the art for now. So now what the, the most interesting thing though is um, if we actually perform relative pose estimation and we're not bound to one scene, um, we can actually use as much data as we want. So we can use the classic data sets in visual localization and train on those and see if our results will improve even further. So um, these are our results as I've shown before, trained on Cambridge landmarks. And uh, what we do is actually we take a couple of um, data sets, not really large, but much larger than Cambridge landmarks, uh, the 1DSFM data set and the Paris data set. And we pre-train on these data sets and then fine tune on the Cambridge landmarks. And we see that if we actually pre-train on 1DSFM, we get an average error which is actually larger than the one we had only training on Cambridge landmarks. So it's not so easy for our network to leverage all this amount of data. Uh, but as soon as we start training on larger data sets like Paris or combined Paris and 1DSFM, uh, we see that we can get an error um, here which is actually much lower, a much lower positional error. Um, so we have improved uh, the error by 20 centimeters by just using more data because we can train one network uh, for all scenes. Um, now on indoor data sets, which is also um, some, something that we, um, that as I've shown before, it's kind of uh, the goal where CIF-based methods don't work. Uh, we can also see that we have actually quite an improvement in uh, positional error with respect to PoseNet. Now the challenge here is that um, the CNN for image retrieval was trained on outdoor scenes. So it doesn't perform so well on these kind of textureless indoor scenes. So this is something that uh, we still need to adapt. So just as a, as a conclusion, um, I would be not um, so fast in disregarding 15 years of work on CIF-based localization, of course. Um, so CIF-based is really good in outdoor scenes, so there's still quite a gap to fulfill there for uh, scene and based methods. Uh, but there is a lot of potential actually in indoor scenes where we cannot use CIF-based methods because essentially there are no uh, features that we can detect from these textureless scenes. Um, I, I also presented our first work towards um, general visual localization, which is um, based on relative pose estimation. And um, what we do here is we, um, so we have tried to mimic the visual localization pipeline by having this feature extraction and then this matching step. And the key advantage here is that we now have one network to perform localization in any scene. But of course, um, it's not all good uh, in our method yet. Uh, so there's still quite uh, a long problem, uh, a, a big problem with uh, generalization. So we have noticed that if we don't show any of the images of the test scene um, to the network at train time, then uh, performance drops quite a lot. So you can use all the data that you want to improve your localization, but you still have to show some of the training images of the particular scene uh, for the network to actually perform well. So this is something that, um, that we're working on right now. Um, so I'm really happy to, to talk to you about any of the topics uh, later on during the break, being um, tracking, segmentation, or localization. And I want to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.
Just, just out of curiosity, what is the intuition behind um, the factors that the beta parameter depends on? Does it depend on the camera's intrinsics or the distance? Because the quaternion should be unit quaternion, right? And mm -hmm. then, and the, the distance, the other one probably depends on the distance. I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are on that. Um, so it depends a lot on the scale of the scene and on the distance, um, the, t the mean distance of the main object where all the, um, the texture is um, to the camera. So in outdoor scenes, this distance is really large. Um, so I would say that, um, for example, um, orientation doesn't, uh, so changes much more uh, because if you change one degree, you're looking at a completely different object. While in indoor scenes, you change one degree and you know, your object hasn't changed so much. So you're just looking at pretty much the same scene. Um, so this is why um, this beta is so different, especially um, comparing indoor and outdoor scenes. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, so you talked about this loss on the essential matrix, and I was just wondering if you tried any different losses, like L1 loss, or maybe this would help to like push it even further to like having this ratio of one or a second uh, value being close to zero. Mm -hmm. um, so we did try the L1 loss. Um, it doesn't really work because we don't. We're not really looking for a, for a sparse matrix, right? I mean, we, the properties are completely different. Um, what is really surprising is that by just using the L2 loss, we get these properties of the essential matrix essentially for free. So this was actually one of the, one of the surprising findings. So um, I probably just missed that part of the talk, but um, when you do relative pose estimations, for a specific camera position, you have um, multiple uh, training cameras, so you have multiple relative poses. So how do you ag aggregate that to get the final pose estimation? Um, so essentially, we use um, in a Ranza group, so, so the classic uh, method that is used for um, pose estimation, uh, where you triangulate all your cameras, and then you get the best position given all the information. And the good thing is that you can easily throw out outliers within this Ranza loop. Um, so it doesn't matter so much if the CNN retrieval has, I don't know, five or six images which are completely unrelated. So this will be thrown out in the Ranza loop. So I haven't shown actually the, the ablation results on that, uh, but the Ranza loop helps a lot, especially when um, this image retrieval doesn't work. Uh, really nice talk. So uh, my question uh, is more about like um, the philosophy of this end-to-end -end pipeline because um, you talked about how 3D, 2D matching really helps and has very accurate performance, but it fails at the, at the indoor scenes. Mm -hmm. So what I uh, believe is the real uncertainty or the learning potential is really in the correspondence problem whereas the estimation problem is more or less very analytical and we know how to solve, like it's a solved problem. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you see that this end-to-end -end pipeline where we regress the parameters of the camera makes more sense or is it better to decouple the, uh, the correspondence problem from the pose estimation problem and focus all the learning mechanism and machinery on the correspondence problem instead mm -hmm. of solving this whole thing as an end-to-end -end, mm -hmm. uh, pipeline. So what's your view on that? Um, yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, so there are some methods um, like um, the DSAC that I mentioned and, and kind of follow-up work that indeed do learn these 2D, 3D correspondences and then perform the rest of the pipeline in a classic way. And even, um, so you can make Ransack differentiable so that you can even backprog through it and this is currently uh, the most accurate method for outdoor scenes or indoor scenes where there's texture. Uh, I'm not so sure actually how it would work for uh, the textureless indoor scenes. Because um, there, if you actually try to perform really accurate 2D to 3D matches, um, I think it's really hard because there's really a lot of ambiguity. So in that sense, I would say that um, you would need to look at more uh, like the general uh, view that you can see in your image. So really all the features together and not trying to focus on 2D, 3D matches. 
Um, so probably a hybrid of the two methods is what's going to work best at the end. Um, but I, uh, but for now, definitely uh, what you said, like the 2D, 3D um, learned part, and then the classical um, geometry part is what works best, um, at least for the classic scenes. But I think that these are not the scenes that we should be targeting because we're already pretty good at these scenes. So in the indoor scenes, it, it's a much more tight battle. So I guess, I guess we will see. I cannot make any like right predictions right now. Thank our speaker again. Uh, before we announce the next person, I need to say something about logistics. Uh, poster presenters, uh, you go, you go like downstairs there, like the escalator, and your poster number is 194 plus whatever is written in the program. Okay, it's 194 plus whatever is written in your program. So if it is one, it's 195. If it is two, it's 196. Uh, as uh, Colton said yesterday, it's like I plus 194, okay? Anyway, um, and one last thing. Uh, if you are sitting at the back, you cannot get the bags, okay? These bags are all for you. They have like Facebook wireless chargers. They have um, Uber power banks. They had awesome things. So come to the front seats, get your bags. Thank you. So before going to the poster session, we're going to have a quick word from one of our sponsors. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Brian Catanzaro, the Vice President of Applied Deep Learning Research at NVIDIA. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm planning to be brief. I know we've got a lot of stuff on the schedule today. Um, NVIDIA is really happy to be a sponsor of the Women in Computer Vision workshop today, um, and it's just a real honor uh, for us to be here and, and uh, participate with you a little bit. Um, I wanted to say a few things about NVIDIA. Some of you may know us as a computer chip company or even a gaming company, uh, and it's true, lots of people like to play video games on our GPUs. But these days, um, NVIDIA is an accelerated computing company, and our primary mission is to bring AI to the world. Um, in all sorts of different applications, and computer vision being, you know, one of the fields where um, we're, we just really think we have we have the opportunity to make an impact. And uh, of course, the way that happens is by researchers like you, that are inventing new things, that are figuring out new ways of um, using computer vision and and um, solving the world's problems. So your work is very important to us at Nvidia, um, and. Uh, we also do a lot of computer vision research internally. Um, we have a lot of different groups that are, that are um, doing computer vision research. Um, we have a lot of great leaders uh, in the company that are doing great things. One of them, um, Shalini DeMello, is sitting, sitting back there. Um, we also have um, Sonia Fiedler recently joined, uh, leading a new um, group in Toronto. And um, Carolina Prada is one of our leaders in the self-driving car computer vision um, work that we do. Um, so there's, there's a lot of great stuff going on in a lot of different uh, teams around the, uh, around the company that is very connected to the work you're doing and, and uh, the work that you're doing is very interesting to us. Um, one of the other things I wanted to say about NVIDIA is that uh, it's a really great place to do your life's work because we're connected with so many different kinds of companies and, and institutions around the world. You know, as AI and computer vision really start um, transforming the way we do things, um, there's an opportunity to, to um, have a broad impact by being connected to so many different kinds of work that's happening with so many different companies, from self-driving cars to medical imaging to computer graphics. Um, we work with institutions and, and companies around the world. Um, and our open compute platform, you know, where, where a lot of computer vision research happens on, on our GPUs, is something that um, people use in, in so many different kinds of projects. And that's one of the reasons that I'm really excited to be at NVIDIA is because the work that me and my team does has a chance to be connected with so many other um, projects that are going on around the world. We can't imagine transforming the world through AI and computer vision without you, without the women uh, in computer vision. You know, I can't, I can't imagine how um, AI could transform the world economy without the input and the vision and guidance of 
the women of the world who have a unique perspective. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we're sponsoring the workshop. We really feel like um, AI is changing the world and there's an important role for, um, for women to play in that and especially women doing computer vision research. So that's um, why we're honored to be here uh, sponsoring this today. A few more things I wanted to mention. Uh, NVIDIA is a, a very collaborative environment. It's, it's one team. Our CEO likes to say that there's not a single project in the company that doesn't have everybody working together across organizational boundaries. And that gives us a lot of flexibility to move between different kinds of projects. Um, we have a lot of flexible work hours and parental leave policies. Um, and uh, I guess the last thing I want to mention, you don't have to be a computer gamer <laughs> to work at NVIDIA. Um, researchers like you working in computer vision have a lot of influence and, and a lot of impact um, at NVIDIA. And, and um, so I, want, I just wanted to give you that in introduction. And um, if you're interested in learning more about opportunities at NVIDIA, uh, please come talk to me or Sh Shalini or, or uh, somebody else. We'd, we'd love to talk. And um, thanks again for letting us be part of this great workshop. Thank you, Brian. So um, we will now move to our poster session. Since we're running a bit late, um, we will not significantly cut into the poster session since it's a significant part of this workshop. Um, instead, uh, what we will do is we will start the uh, next session, the oral session, uh, a bit late, so 20 minutes later. We will come back and start at 11.50. And we will slightly cut into the lunch break um, and so we will have a one hour lunch instead of one hour and 20 minutes. So we will see you here uh, back at 11.50 and you can now uh, take a break and go and see the posters outside. Thank you.